Hello, Ball with fans, and welcome to the latest in the Press Pass series on Back of the Net. And, well, this week, well, over the last week and a half, the media that's associated with the Cherries, well, they'll have been working in overdrive because last week they weren't only covering our relegation from the Premier League, but also the fact that our manager, Eddie Howe, departed the club on Saturday, leaving many people stunned. One of the people that was stunned is my podcast colleague, Jeff Hayward. Jeff? Are you over it yet? In recovery. <laughs> In recovery. Yeah, that's um, that's pretty much how I am. Um, I think the numbness has gone now. Just wondering what's next. But maybe we can find out tonight. Who knows? Were the media shocked? Well, we'll find out because we're delighted today to be joined by two people. Someone, the first, with very close associations with the club and the area over the years. And someone that can be seen on Sky Sports regularly. It is Mark McAdam. Mark, how are you? How are you doing, boys? You okay? Yeah, very good. Very good. Thank you. And also, we've got a regular face on the podcast as well. Someone who's been relentlessly covering Bournemouth this season in written form and who today announced that he will still continue to cover the Cherries. It is Peter Rutzler from The Athletic. Peter, how's it going? Not too bad, Sam. How are you guys? Yeah, not too bad. It's It's been a crazy week. Now, Peter, of course, uh, people who are subscribed to the podcast uh, will have seen him before. But Mark, I'm sure if you're football fans, you're sports fans, you'll know his face. You'll have heard his name, but he's a new face on the podcast. Um, so, Mark, um, for people that haven't seen you, can you maybe tell us a little bit about your relationship with the club and your path to, well, to doing what you're doing now with Sky? Yeah, so I initially um, have a connection that goes right back to the very early days of AFC Bournemouth because I was born in Boscombe, the old Boscombe Hospital across the road from the stadium. I went to Kings Park School, which is the primary school right across the road, and then Porchester School right round the back. So every day going to primary school, every day going to senior school, I was walking past the stadium. So that's where really where my connection with AFC Bournemouth started. Um, but working for them... It was back in 2000, 2001 when I started working in the media department. And to be honest, throughout the whole of the last 19 years or so, I've had that connection, that association, whether it's uh, working directly for the club uh, or working uh, through the media uh, covering Bournemouth. There's always been red and black through my work and my personal life and my football life. So, yeah, it's a, it's a long standing connection, um, which I'm pleased to say for the last 12 years has actually been quite a happy one. Yeah, well, uh, it has been happy. There's been lots of highs and lows, but in the main, there have been highs. And, you know, there have also been a few shocks over the years here and there, minus 17, uh, you know, minus 10 points, deductions, etc. Even getting to the Premier League was quite a shock for us. But in terms of seismic shock levels, Saturday night, 9pm, uh, what were your thoughts when the club released the news that Eddie was leaving? I have to be honest, I wasn't surprised. Um, I always felt deep down that he, he was going to leave at the end of the season. I always felt like it was time. I'd seen how much he'd been hurting over the course of the, of the few months, particularly before lockdown, particularly in that bad run. And it was just taking its toll on the gaffer. Now, Eddie Howe is someone that gets into that football club at, at 6am every day and leaves at, at 6 or 7 every evening. He works seven days a week. Um, in fact, he probably neglects his family so much so that he is focused on AFC Bournemouth. You know, it's red and black that, that runs through his veins. He cares so deeply about that club and, and everything that it means and stands for. He, he has such an affinity for the fans. And you could just get that sense that whilst things weren't going so well on the pitch, he was feeling it and he was hurting more than anyone else. And it really, really does mean so much to him. You look at his legacy, you look at what he's, what he's achieved, you look at the fact he's got a young family as well. And it just all pointed towards the fact that, sadly, the, the journey had come to an end um, and that this was the right time, regardless of promotion uh, or, or survival or relegation, that, that, that Eddie would probably move on this summer. Um, it, it's a sad day. And, um, but, yeah, at the time, I wasn't, I wasn't surprised. Yeah, Jeff. Yeah, why Why do you think he waited until Saturday night at 9pm to make that decision, Mark? Do you think he was he was finding it so difficult to choose or was there something going on at the club that affected his decision-making? I think it was probably an internal decision and he was probably wrestling with himself. Um, you know, why would you walk away from the greatest job in football in his mind? You know, why would you walk away from a club 
that you've achieved so much with. Why would you walk away from a football club on, on a low, the first low that you, you've ever had since, since you joined uh, or became manager, certainly? Um, so I think that would have been the thing. There would have been a, a part of him that was like, no, I have to leave on a positive. I have to leave on a high. There's still things that I want to achieve off the field and away from, from the stadium, the, the training ground, the legacy that he was, that was intense on leaving. Um, so I think that was a big decision, really. Want, you know, you had this in your mind, right, we'll survive in the Premier League. Then I'll walk away having had that, that kind of, you know, the, 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 the sandwich of starting my Bournemouth managerial career with the greatest escape of all time. And then ending it with a great escape would have been kind of the perfect uh, circle to start and finish his relationship with the club as a manager. Obviously, that when that didn't happen, there would have been perhaps a part of him that thought, well, uh, this doesn't feel right to walk away on a negative. But eventually, conversations, decisions, probably some family time, let the dust settle. And then he just decided that it was it was a challenge for someone else to take on. Yeah. Is that how you read it as well, Peter? Yeah, I completely agree with with Mark, to be honest. I think similar to you guys in that over the course of the week, the longer the decision took, I did feel maybe, you know, we, we're looking at a more positive outcome here and they're trying to plot a way forward. But I think Mark's right, really. I think for Eddie, it was a case of convincing himself to leave, you know, it's it, because it is such a wrench and such a difficult thing to do after so long, to pull himself away, to leave the club in the championship. I think that was a very hard thing to do. Uh, I think from a from a club perspective as well, I think they you know, they maybe think, uh, consider, would want to consider some kind of change, some kind of way of moving forward uh, afterwards. You know, the last 12 months in terms of performances haven't been as, as good as we've known them to be in the Premier League. And I think that that comes into it as well. But, you know, I think, you know, we consider, you know, the year this has been, I mean, not just performances, but you factor in lockdown as well, working under those constraints. And of course, Eddie would have spent some time with his family, which he wouldn't have had over the past decade. You know, this has been such, you know, as Mark outlined so well there, like, you know, Eddie does work constantly. Um, and I think part of him would have thought, you know, I, maybe I can take a break here and actually be involved with the people who are important in my life in a separate way and, and use that time effectively, which, of course, he will do. That's that's in his nature. Um, so I guess there is it does feel a bit like a natural parting at this point. Um but, you know, as, as I said, you know, as the week went on, you, you grow in confidence in thinking that he'll stay. But as it turned out, it wasn't the case. Uh, I noticed you tweeted, Peter, bang on 9pm, that the same as the club, that he'd left the club. Is there, uh, we, What kind of notice did you get? Or were you just very quick relaying the news when you heard it? Is this something you had a heads up on? I did have a slight heads up, but I was slow on my tweet and made a typo. So, um, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's how it goes. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I mean, you know, in terms of shock value, um, to me as a fan, it came as a big shock, especially given what we'd seen on Tuesday with the statement from Maxim Den, who was saying that we are committed to getting us back into the Premier League. And, you know, every single Cherries fan thinking that's probably going to be with Eddie. So uh, to us, it was, you know, quite a curveball, but seemingly not to you. Yeah, I, th I think... Again, as I was saying, you know, as the week goes on and when you when we heard Max's statement, you know, an unprecedented statement from the owner committing to taking the team back. Now, a lot of the talk ahead of relegation was what's the impact going to be? What's the financial impact going to be? How are the club going to cope? You know, who's going to leave? Um, and I guess surrounding that was always that sense of what's the owner going to do? How did where does he stand here? Um, and the fact he came out, he said that, you know, he he, he wants to back the, the, the team to, to get back into the Premier League at the first time of asking. Um, there's, this, there's, there's quite a strong sense of, yes, a couple of players will go, but, you know, we want to keep the squad together, which he said in his statement. So that really did change the sort of impression ahead of this season. Now, of course, there are still financial difficulties that will naturally occur from relegation, which we've, we've talked about before. And you know, they're, they're very reliant on broadcast revenue and, and things like that. So that, that, that will come into play. But the owner's statement definitely changed, changed the, the feeling because you think if you're Eddie Howe, I think, well, this is a good opportunity. There's a strong young squad here that maybe I can, I can take them back. And that, that, that was part of my thinking. That's where I thought he may go, but um, that wasn't to be. And Mark, from the, the detailed release and that really lengthy letter that Eddie probably spent the last seven days writing, it was long enough, certainly. Um, do you think that they they knew for a long time that they were going to make this statement and it was all planned to happen at 9pm? I mean, you know from working in the media team how they do things. Do you think that was quite deliberate? And 
And if so, how do you think they have handled the, the announcement? I think there's no right or wrong time to announce when someone as iconic as Eddie Howe is, is leaving the football club. You know, it's, it's something you, you want to get right. Um, it's something that takes a bit of time. And I think, to be honest, I think there would have probably been a, a lot of conversations had Sunday night, Monday. Uh, I know Maxim was, was hurting a lot on Monday and, and he wasn't keen to, to talk to people, talk to anyone. He was, he was really down in the dumps, really upset with the relegation. So I think that was why that there was a little bit of a delay there. Then he releases his statement. And then, of course, you've got the, the Nathan Aki news that happens as well, which, which changes the dynamic once again. And yeah. you're thinking, well, hang on, I don't... Can you announce Nathan Aki leaving and Eddie Howe leaving on the same day? Um, so, you know, it's just a case of finding the right time, um, getting things right, getting the statement right. Um, Eddie being 100% sure that the decision he's making is the right one for himself and the football club and, and the family. Uh, and, and, you know, whatever time it is, is whatever time it is. It's sort of, you know, rolling news, Sky Sports news. The amount of times I've been called up at 5 a.m. or, or 1 a.m., can you get down to such and such? Can you get here in the morning? This is happening. That's happening. This is just broken. You know, it doesn't matter what time of the day is Saturday yeah. night uh, or, or, or Sunday morning or, or Monday afternoon. When the news comes out, the news comes out. And Mark, as someone who's had a close association with the club, I mean, what was your sort of course of action on the Saturday night? Is it a case of as soon as you hear the news, uh, you know, the adrenaline starts pumping and you enter um, a reporter mode straight away? Or, you know, did you have any room for like any emotion at that point in time? Or was it literally, OK, you know, I'm on this now? I'd kind of um, divorced myself from the emotional connection to this story um, some time ago. Um, so it was just for me, it was just a case of as and when it's going to happen and, and then you action things. I was actually out walking um, in Ringwood Forest um, on Saturday night and um, I got a, a phone call and they said, get ready, stuff's happening. So then I had, to, I had to jog to a spot in the forest where I had enough signal to be able to tweet, make phone calls, speak to people and, and action everything that was happening. So all I remember was jogging really quickly to a place where I got some signal and then I stood there for about the next sort of half an hour to an hour uh, on the phone to Sky Sports News, I did a live phone interview straight away as soon as we got the news and, and that broke. So that, that was the sort of priority. And then, of course, in the sort of modern world of social media, you, you're looking at Facebook, you're doing tweets, you're speaking to people. As you can imagine, the same as Peter, my phone was red hot for the whole of Saturday night. I think I got into bed about half past one, two o'clock in the morning. And I was, <laughs> my, my brain was going. I was just all over the place because so much had happened in that sort of three or four hour spell. And it's only really when you wake up and I was down at the Vitality Stadium at 8 a.m. the next day and you start to sort of get your head around what he's achieved and, and what the story is and the agenda for that day. And you, and you start to sort of speak live on TV. Eddie Howe is no longer the AFC Bournemouth manager for the first time in eight years, the football club and you're looking for a new boss. And, and then it starts to sink in that this is a huge day for the football club. It's a sad day, uh, but it's also a time to reflect on the most amazing journey that, that any football club has probably had over the last 12 years. It was, uh, it was quite interesting to see um, your tweet with the sign uh, someone's drawn up saying, you know, Eddie Howe, we love you on the Vitality sign. And I think it was Alex Deutsch who, um, who tweeted, oh, my goodness, Jeff Mostyn's handwriting's improved, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't, but, don't go, Eddie, we love you. But it was too late because he'd already gone. <laughs> yeah, Jeff? And, and Peter, from speaking to Chris Temple, who came on our show live an hour or so after the news broke, I mean, he, he was pretty convinced it was a mutual decision. Uh, do you think it was or do you think the club would have kept Eddie on if he if he'd wanted to stay? Yeah, I think so. I, I, I think it's very easy to read into something when it's when it's mutual um, and draw conclusions from it. I think, you know, it won't be until we hear Eddie speaks, you know, the, the full extent of his thinking. But I think for, for, from the club's perspective, you know, you've got a manager who's got three promotions on his CV. He's a club legend. You, he, yeah, there's no there's no backing away from that now. They, it can be packaged as mutual, as I was saying before, because it does feel like a natural parting. That, you know, performances haven't gone the way they probably would have wanted, and there's a case for some kind of change. A difficult one in this period with a short amount of time between the two seasons. So I think when you factor all of that in, yeah, it's it certainly seems Eddie's call cool for sure. What do you think about, uh, Peter, about the players that have bought in uh, to Eddie Howe? Players like Aaron Ramsdale, Lloyd Kelly... 
What are their thoughts and emotions going to be now that the manager that they signed for is now no longer at the club? It must be a confusing time for them. Yeah, it will be. I think speaking to most players when they join the club and, and those around them, the, one of the biggest draws about Bournemouth is Eddie Howe and the chance to work with him. You know, he's known, you know, so many past players will say, you know, they don't know how lucky they were until they left. Um, and that, that message gets around that Eddie works with players individually. He improves players on an individual basis. He'll take the time to, to go through their clips with them, to, to work on individual tiny bits of their game that can, that can set them apart and really take them to the next level. Now, you look at players like Aaron Ramsdale or, or Lloyd Kelly, who's come in recently, or Anup Danjuma. They've arrived at Bournemouth. They're young and they want to progress. And they want to go that next step. And yeah, Eddie would have been a big part in that. And, you know, naturally, like everyone at the moment, there's that sense of uncertainty about what, what is to follow, what is going to come next. Um, but, you know, that's that will be out of their hands at the moment. And, you know, they'll they'll have to see what comes next, really. It's, yeah, I mean, for everyone, it's a shock. And I, it'll be interesting to see how the club go forward after after this. So relegation market came as a bitter blow. Um, we felt on the podcast uh, that there's been a relegation feel about this season for for quite a while, and uh, you know there's been injuries, individual situations with players like uh, Fraser and I, coronavirus playing behind closed doors, lack of activity with regards to the training ground. It just feels that there's a lot that hasn't gone right this season. Do you think these factors would have would have impacted Eddie in a significant way? I think so. Absolutely. I think the first thing you look at and, and the, the, the squad that he had, and, and he said this right at the beginning of the season, he felt this was his strongest ever squad at AFC Bournemouth when everyone was fit. Sadly, they weren't all fit at the same time until the latter stages of the season after, after lockdown. But still, you didn't have Charlie Daniels, you didn't have Simon Francis uh, and obviously uh, no Ryan Fraser. So, he never really got to select from the strongest squad he believed he had throughout his whole time at the football club. So, you know, you put a fit David Brooks into that season, you put a fit Lloyd Kelly into that season, um, and I think Bournemouth would have had five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten more points, no question about it. They wouldn't have got relegated if he'd had those players at his disposal, regardless of, you know, the, the Ryan Fraser situation uh, and the Jordan Ives situation. Those two players alone that were injured throughout the whole of the campaign were the ones that were with a big blow uh, for, for Eddie. Uh, Mark, do you think if we'd stayed up, this you know situation would be different and he'd still be here? No. I think, I genuinely think he, he felt like this was the time to, to end the journey. I think this was, this was the point in his life. Um, and perhaps during lockdown, and, and I don't know, I'm, I'm talking from my own perspective here, perhaps during lockdown, he spent so much time with his young family um, you know, Harry, Rocky and TJ. And he's looking at them and thinking, well, you're the most incredible people in my life with my wife. And I've got to spend 10, 12 weeks with you over lockdown. And some, sometimes you realise things are slightly more important in life than football. And for, for Eddie, because he was so committed to the football club, he couldn't do a part-time commitment as a manager. He was, he was 100% in or he was out. And I think that was where the, the decision came to in the end. And I just think perhaps spending time with the boys and um, you, you saw him the other day, um, Sunday morning, he was out playing tennis with Harry and Rocky. Um, and that's what it was about. That's what we, it was about for him. The decision was about family. And less than 24 hours after leaving the Bournemouth job, he was out with his kids playing tennis in a local park. And, and that's what it was all about at the end of the day. For me, there were a number of pivotal, pivotal games uh, that really where, where he looked shattered giving press conferences afterwards. One of those that stood out for me was that Crystal Palace game where we lost 1-0 playing against 10 men for ages. And the Burnley game again was, well, both Burnley games were, were similar. Peter, was there anyone that stood out for you that you thought that's the one that's that's made his decision? I think it was very clear by Southampton. Um, I know that was quite late in the day, but I think coming out after Southampton, the way that game had gone, um, the late goal from you know Sam's late goal, and that was ruled out. You know that was a that was an Eddie Howe that was really really hurting. And I think you're right to pick up those two games actually because those are the first that come to my mind. I remember Palace away. I remember sitting in the press box there and just watching on, and you, you just knew that there was nothing coming from the team. And I think that's the first time where you had some really serious 
alarm bells about the direction the team were heading. Um, you know, I think the start of the season was solid and in, in October it sort of was like the other way, wasn't it? There were no goals scored, but, you know, defensively it looked, looked like, you know, that was a, a key area that had been solved. But by the time we got to November, December, it started to move the other way. And um, that said, you, you, you wouldn't associate, you know, Eddie Howe with losing faith. That's that's one of his, you know, he'd come back in and in, in the in his Friday morning press conferences nice and early and would come out fighting. I think the the press conference before Brighton was probably his sharpest um, from a media perspective, I think. I can't remember if you were there, Mark, but he, you know, he was very much focused on the game. There was It was after the Watford result. Um, very quick, very, so, as he always is, he's very articulate and he, he knows to answer questions in the right way that can try and elicit a response to his players, you know, that is an opportunity to speak to his players directly, really. Um, that was a game that felt quite that felt quite tense. Um, but yeah, the, the thinking afterwards, um, Palace and Newcastle. I think I think with Palace in particular, because there'd been so much optimism during lockdown, the ideas of the, the players were coming back. You know, I, th- I think Eddie himself felt very very positive coming coming into it and thinking, right, we can easily turn this around here. You know, there's so much quality, and um, the way that game panned out um and then to follow it with, with with Newcastle as well um I think those were quite defining games from from his you know, demeanor perspective um but uh yeah I think I, I picked those ones out it's uh but as I say you know you, you, you I think you could see I think as Mark said at the start you know he, he did seem that bit more drained you could you could you could see it more visibly um compared to the start of the season now I, I've only been covering the club for for a season so um it's 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 more difficult for me to provide that that sort of longer context but certainly towards the back end it was more noticeable uh, do you think peter that uh you know we're a small club we rely on fans to make a noise um inside dean court and eddie howe's a people person do you think that the whole you know covid um playing behind closed doors has been something you know like eddie howe's been sort of missing the fans and it seems to me like he felt he looked Maybe this was down to our league position and how we were performing, but he looked actually quite uncomfortable doing all this kind of stuff via Zoom. Whereas previously I've seen him in a press conference and we've been on a sort of losing run, but having the people there, you know, with him in the media suite has you know, managed to, you know, get him a smile. Um, I don't know, he just seemed very uncomfortable with how remote all the things were. Yeah, it's a, I, think most, I think most managers are like that though. I mean, it's... Uh... Well, it depends. Actually, if you're Nuno Espirito Santo, he probably loves it. Um, it's uh, yeah, it's a really different thing. It's a really different feeling. You're there is no, that that interaction is totally different. You have a set number of questions, and you know sometimes you, you 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 do shorter questions that aren't really relevant to what you want to talk about, and you build a relationship. And Eddie's got great relationships with with several reporters, Mark especially. Um, and you do miss that. You're you're not able to convey messages in the way you'd probably want to. Um, I wouldn't. I think coming back to the point about the crowd, I, I certainly think that the, the team missed the crowd, especially in the the first couple of games after lockdown, where you just need someone to, to just send a lightning bolt through them, really, just to keep them, get them going, get push themselves that that extra limit that sometimes you can't just naturally um, produce. Now there was always talk about the players aren't putting in effort, which is which is nonsense. Um, you know the players do try, and, and, and when you when you're lacking confidence and and collectively, it's one of those feelings in football. You you can see it, you can see it drain from a side, and that was certainly the case in those opening games. Um, so I think from that side, they certainly missed it. And I think if you think about Eddie missing the crowd, I think the one time he really missed it was after Everton. Um, I think that was the first thing he mentioned uh, when he started to do his media after the game was not being able to share in the moment which seems unusual you, about you know sharing a moment relegation but you know there is that bond you you want to you want to know that you're feeling responsible and and to show that and i think he he really missed that interaction and and you you're, you're I and mean, he's feeling that hurt and he wants to share it because he is a supporter you know as as we all know and um i think that was the that was a that was a real moment there well let, let's try and move on i mean it's all difficult for everybody but let's try and do that so mark do you know anything about the potential successor and the kind of timelines we should be expecting on an announcement 
Um, well, obviously, like I said on Sky Sports News um, at the weekend, the club has two options. They promote from within or they bring someone in um, externally. And I think there are pros and cons for, for both situations. Obviously, you, you bring someone in through the, the, the sort of the system, as it were, Jason Tinnell, Stephen Purchase, uh, Simon Weatherson, Steve Fletcher. There's a, there's a whole collection of coaches and backroom staff that have all uh, been associated with the club. Uh, play for the club, understand the values and the community spirit of the club, and they know what has been achieved and what's been built and how it's been done. Um, in some senses, you you know, post-COVID, financial issues, being relegated from the Premier League, with all of that going on, the last thing you want is a new face in there and a new voice and someone who's going to change everything. Perhaps a little bit of consistency and continuity would be the most ideal thing at the moment. And just, just stabilise things because it's going to be a challenge anyway going down to the, the championship. Um, so if you keep a consistent voice and, and face in and amongst that train, training ground and the players know who the manager is, they know um, what he's about and his coaching methods, then that might be the most ideal scenario at the moment. Alternatively, of course, you go in and get someone with experience like Chris Hewton, uh, who, who has been there, done it, got the T-shirt, he got Newcastle promoted. Uh, he got Birmingham into the playoffs. He got Brighton promoted and stabilised them within the top flight. So, you know, that would be another attractive uh, proposition uh, and, and a really, really genuinely decent guy and a good coach with good experience. So it's, it's two options for the football club. I don't think they're, they're, they're definitely not rushing any decision. They're, they're not going to go out and get the first guy. They think they are going to think about things. They've obviously had a, a bit of time now to assess what their options are and what they want to do, speak to people, digest the news, and work out what the best thing to do for the club is. I understand there'll probably be an appointment at the, the beginning of next week. Um, so, you know, they, they will make their moves at the moment. They'll be speaking to who they want to speak to, and then they'll make a decision, I would have thought, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday next week. With the um, with the timing of their announcements, half of me is expecting a 4 a.m. Sunday morning thing. You never know. <laughs> they might be announcing it at some <laughs> silly time like that. But, Mark, in terms of what Eddie said on his open letter to the fans, he, he said... There, you know, they've they've agreed there needs to be a new direction. But you know, if it is to be someone like Jason Tindall, for instance, how, how would they seriously be able to deploy a new direction, given that Howe's philosophy is going to be have been etched on their brain for the last sort of eight years or so? And let's be honest, Howe's philosophy hasn't been a bad one. Um, no, so if, <laughs> if, if, if there is 90% of Eddie Howe in the, the new team moving forward and 10% and of another manager, then that, that's, that's no bad thing. Um, I think we all know that this season, it hasn't been a Bournemouth side. It hasn't looked like a Bournemouth side, but it's not a million miles away from being a Bournemouth side. So one or two players, one or two tweaks, and, and we, I believe we can get back to, to what we're about, fast, expansive, attacking football, exciting to watch. Um, you score five, but we'll score six. We might be three down, but that doesn't matter. We've got a no-fear attitude. And I don't think we could be far away from that. So I think you, whoever comes in, um, if they don't change too much and they can keep the, the core of the squad together, then potentially we, we could see a, a really exciting Bournemouth team you know, in, in the next sort of six to eight weeks. Right. Okay. And um, do you agree with that, Peter? In general, yeah. And I think the main thing for me is time, because there just isn't enough of it. You can't. I think with an external candidate, you know, you, he may bring in an assistant. He may want to change things. He's got to build relationships with the backroom staff, with the players. Um, the players are back on August seventeenth. That's that's not long at all. Season starts on September twelfth. You know, you're you're dealing with timeframes that are very difficult to make that massive overhaul um, if you wanted a real you know clean break so to speak and, and, and as Mark says there there are you have to weigh up whether that would be a useful thing was are there more risks with that yeah I think naturally there are um, so you can understand the need for an internal uh, appointment now obviously there's risks with an internal because of whether they have the experience it's very different being a being a coach to being a manager not least at a level like the championship um, but they've all been there with Eddie it won't be completely alien um, so I see the merits to it. I certainly see the merits to it. And, and as Mark outlined there, you know, they're not, they're not a million miles away. And when you actually look at the squad, um, you, you take out a couple who we think will leave. So Nathan Ake's, Nathan Ake's left now, um, expect Callum Wilson and Joshua, Joshua King probably to follow. Um, 
And, you know, if they can keep some of the, you know, the, the shining lights at, at David Brooks for a little bit of time, he hasn't played for nearly a year. He may want more yeah. minutes. Lewis Cook needs more minutes. Um, you can keep those and then couple it with, you know, the younger core, you know, the likes of Sam Surridge has proven he can score goals at championship level. Um, Jack Stacey has come from Luton in the Football League. Chris Meppham, championship. Uh, Lloyd Kelly, championship. So, you know, these players are used to the intensity of the Football League and that's a real, real bonus. You know, it's a different, it's a very different division to the Premier League. Um, to couple that together and you you do have the makings for a strong side and I, I agree with Mark, you know, if they get it right, you know, there's absolutely no reason why Bournemouth shouldn't be competing for promotion this year. The but, thing is as well that, sorry, sorry to interrupt on. you, Sam, I was just going to say, Eddie Howe, whilst he was a club legend and an incredible player, he was a, a, a big unknown when he became the manager and he lost both his first two games, you know, and, and Adam Murray, who was in charge at the, at the time, you know, took a huge gamble on this guy that had been sacked as a first team coach under Kevin Bond. He'd then been managing in the academy. Um, and whilst we all knew the icon he was as a player, no one knew his credentials as a coach and as a manager. And, and at the time, what was he, 32 years old, 31 years old? You know, chucking him in at the deep end. And let's be honest, this was not any ordinary situation. I genuinely and firmly believe if this football club had got relegated in 2008-9, they would have gone bust. They wouldn't have gone down to the conference. They would have gone bust. And Eddie Howe was told that. If you do not keep this club in the, in the football league, this club will not be here. So that kind of pressure on someone's shoulders so young, uh, and he rose to it. So why can't one of the coaching staff that may get the job at Bournemouth now rise to the same challenge? Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, it's, I mean, the more I hear both of you speak, the more I'm convinced it will be an internal appointment. And one thing I've always wondered, um, Peter, you might see um, a bit of this and, you know, Mark as well. Um, you know, Eddie Howe's got good, you know, personal relationships with players. But when AFCB TV do a lot of behind the scenes stuff in training, Jason Tindall always speak, you know, seems to be having some banter with the players and seems to have less of a divide, you know, than Eddie has. Because Eddie is obviously the consumer, you know, professional, but he seems to not get involved in the social kind of stuff on the pitch. Whereas Jason Tindall seems to have a bit of a laugh and a joke with the players and maybe having that you know, continuity, if it was to be someone like JT, for example, um, is, you know, more, well, you know, given how, how long we've got until the start of the new season, having that continuity is going to be extremely beneficial. Yeah, I think Mark out, outlined that pretty well. I mean, that I think with, with JT, he is a very positive character and I think that was where you know, I think with Eddie, they had a, a like you know, they, they had a great dynamic in that Eddie would be more of a step back. I think, in, I think when I asked him about it earlier this season, he says he's a bit more negative and he needs that sort of positive influence. Someone you know who's going to see things in a in a in a in a in a better way, a brighter light, sort of thing. Um, and you know, as as we, as Mark outlined, you know, that having that relationship with the players already is so important. That's a, that's a hard thing to build, and it's it's crucial if you want success. Um, and I, I think, yeah, if you, if you look at you know JT as a, as a character, um, he is that more positive guy. He's he's certainly more influential, and he's not just the second man either. Um, I think that's that's sort of a misconception. You know, he he's got a UEFA Pro license. He's gone up with Eddie. You know, you know, he's been with him, you know, hand in glove the whole way through. So we're not talking about someone who's a complete novice here. Um, and I think, yeah, you, I think those are crucial factors, as as you said, Sam, in, in such a tight uh, time frame. Is JT has he got it within him? Do you think to be his own man, to be to step out of Eddie's shadow and and do it? Do you think, Mark? Absolutely, yeah, no question about it. You know, Jason Tindall um, is an experienced coach, someone that's coached under different managers at different clubs. He managed Weymouth. He's been on the whole of the AFC Bournemouth journey from League Two to the Premier League uh, and the five years in the top flight as well. So does he, has, does he have all the necessary coaching experience, working with, with the best players from all of the various clubs and divisions he's, he's been at and, and been associated with? Absolutely. Will he be his own man? Absolutely. Um, he's, he's one of those characters, and, and Peter touched on it there. He's, he's so positive. He's so upbeat. And that was something that, that would always kind of stick with me. Whenever I went into the manager's room after a game, whenever I saw Eddie or Jason around the football club after a defeat or in the training ground after a, a bad weekend. 
Eddie would always be hurting and upset and disappointed. And, and JT would always be positive, upbeat, and don't worry, we've got the next game. And, and it always amazed me at how positive he was and how much he looked forward and how focused he was on, on the next match and not dwelling in the disappointment of what had happened. You know, regardless of, of the results and the situations and, and how bad everyone thought things were, he was always upbeat. He was always positive. Uh, and that's something that I think would be a, a real asset for him if he were to become the manager. Um, so, you know, obviously there's a long way to go between now and the, and the appointment. But he's, he's definitely got his own characteristics, his own experience. He's played for the club. He's been through adversity, much the same as Eddie Howe, with, with, with knee problems and injury and perhaps finishing his career slightly earlier, earlier than he would have liked to. Um, and I think he, this, this could be his time. You know, he deserves the opportunity. He's got a lot of experience. Um, and if the club decide he's the right man to take them, them forward, I think, you know, any negativity from the fans would be misguided because they clearly haven't met the type of person he is. And, and you look at what he's achieved and where he's been and what he's done. And, and he's got all the, re- the credentials to, to, to take on the challenge. Doing it is something else, but he certainly would fit the bill uh, from the outset, I'm just I'm just picturing a scenario now where Jason Tindall he gets us promoted into the Premier League, and at that point, you know, like Eddie he he thinks, you know what, I'm going to come back. Could it be that How would then be Tindall's number two? Who knows? Um, it'd be you know, um, obviously, you know, we all kind of worry about you know sort of Eddie's health and however long he needs. We hope he takes. Do you think, Peter, very briefly before we ask about the potential? external candidates that the situation might have been very different because at the moment in my head it's like yeah 75 percent is probably going to be like internal but had this been a normal season and we ended on the first or second week of may with a lot more time do you think that ratio would have maybe changed it could have been more of a 50 50 split like you know what we've got time to get in someone external now because it would be quite a change to make you know given who else is on the coaching team and his close staff like Richard Hughes, Steve Fletcher, Steve Purchase, and managers like to bring in their teams. Um, do you think, had it been a normal season, we may have seen an external candidate? Um, I think it would be more time to consider it, and I think there would be a stronger case for it. Um, I think there are other things to consider too. I think one big factor is the ethos of the club. Um, throughout my, you know, throughout this year, one of the things that's always been reiterated to me is the sense of progression, and that you know we see that with the players, the young players they bring in and improve. But that same mentality also applies to the coaching staff. Um, they have a coaching mentor who helps progress them. You take Alan Connell; he started, I think, was he under twelve? Um, he's worked his way up. He's now with the under 18s and that's the same with Sean Cooper, who's now doing the under twenty ones. There's a desire for improvement and self improvement. Um, that goes beyond just improving players and in, in terms of the coaching staff too. And I think when you get the main managerial job and then you go for an external candidate, that does actually maybe jar with that a little bit. And I, you know, that's, that's, you know, maybe a small thing. And I think, you know, if you do have that more time, you, you do have more of a way of building those relationships, bringing your own staff in and changing the, the, the model of the club, but then you do lose some of that. You will lose some of that ethos. And I think that is important to who AFC Bournemouth are. And that's why Eddie Howe is so, you know, it's so determined really to get that training ground as well and to really build the academy because it's all about that self-development, self-improvement, and that applies in, applies in all areas. So Jason becomes the new Eddie. Stephen Purchase is the one who's giving all the grief to the officials next to Eddie, the new Jason Tindall. Do you think there's space for an appointment at director of football level? Because Eddie was renowned for being a micromanager and maybe that took a lot out of him too. Maybe he hasn't had that support from a senior level that perhaps bigger clubs do with that director of football position. What do you think, Mark? Well, obviously you've got Richard Hughes, who's been essentially the director of football um, and and who works very closely with, with Neil Blake. I know there was a little bit of talk about maybe Harry Redknapp in some kind of a, a mentor's role for, for any of the young coaches or, or internal appointments that the club decided to make, which would obviously be an interesting direction. Um, I think, like you've rightly said, Eddie Howe was very hands-on with, with all of the decisions. You know, if they, they were planting trees in the corner of the training ground, Eddie Howe wanted to know about it. Um, and, and that was very much the way he, he was. He, he was involved with every decision at the football club and, and that's the way he felt most comfortable. Um, I think 
Richard Hughes has obviously got that role at the moment and um, you know, I don't entirely know everything he does on a day-to-day basis. We know that obviously the, the football side of things and the recruitment side of, of things is something that, that comes under his remit. So uh, he could continue to do that. But I think really that the most important thing for whoever gets the job is that they, they get the team stabilised and they get things right on the field. Um, and then the club can worry about the bigger picture of having someone to support them off the field should they see that, that being an, an appropriate direction to go down. There's been, there's been a few names, we won't go through them individually, but in terms of external candidates, there have been names that have been mentioned, including John Terry, uh, Chris Hooton, uh, Steve Robinson up at Motherwell, uh, Gary Monk. Have there been any names that you've heard, Mark, that you think, yeah, you know, they'd be a pretty good appointment? I think the, the most obvious one probably is Chris Hooton. Um, you know, yeah. you saw exactly what he did at Brighton. You see what he did at Newcastle under difficult circumstances. Um, he, he took Birmingham into the uh, the playoffs that season. They got relegated from the Premier League, and they had a Europa League campaign as well, um, which started at the you know the beginning of July. And he still managed to ten and a half months later to keep Birmingham uh, at the sharp end of the Championship. So he would be the most obvious natural candidate, someone that's obviously done a great job down the road at Brighton. Um, but other than him, you know, John Terry's another interesting one. Obviously, he's a big name and, you know, he's the sexy name as well, isn't it? Because of, of what he's achieved with um, Chelsea uh, in the Champions League and the Premier League in England. And, and you know, he's an, an icon of the, the Premier League for what he's achieved. Um, and it seems quite amazing that little old Bournemouth um, are attracting, you know, links with those kind of people. Um, so that, that one sort of stood out to me as being an interesting one um so yeah chris chris and john terry were the two that, that sort of caught my eye one was a, a very sensible appointment one was an ambitious exciting one but you know sometimes the ambitious exciting ones don't work out what do you think peter i think with with yeah john terry is definitely an exciting one i guess there's that big risk factor and i think that you know when i think there is a quite a big emphasis on promotion this year i think it is pretty pretty important to me and trying to get that right. They'd probably want to reduce risk if they can. Um, I mean, Stephen Robinson was the one that I quite liked, just on a on a sense that, you know, he's he's got that sense of being there before. He spent seven years as a player here. He'll know some of the backroom staff like Richard Hughes and uh, Steve Fletcher and, and, and Stephen Purchase. So um, so that 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 that's a feather in his cap. The, the flip side, of course, is as much as he's worked miracles with Motherwell on a tiny budget, um, it's hard to gauge the SPL um, in its current strength and also then how that will translate to, to, to the championship and also how we would operate with a, with a Premier League squad. Now, he's, you know, he interviewed for the Northern Ireland job, so he's clearly doing something right. Um, but yeah, he, he for me, was, was, seemed like a, a viable option at least. Um, but I, I agree with Mark. I think if, you, if you're going to go external, you're looking at Chris Heaton. You need someone who's been there, done it. I mean, there, there's no better at external candidate, I don't think, than, than, than Hewton for, for taking a team into the Premier League. It's quite interesting on uh, Monday. I mean, I don't know what Sky Sports figures are for um, Scottish football, Mark, but um, it seemed that all the AFC Bournemouth hashtag were watching Ross County v Motherwell on uh, Monday night just to see <laughs> how they performed. And apparently it wasn't Motherwell's performance. There was, you know, sideways football, not much attacking, barely any shots on goal. We thought, that's the Bournemouth we know and love. <laughs> could, could, could he be the next man? But yeah, I mean, it's going to be interesting to see how it pans out. And how is it working at the moment, Mark? Because do, do you know if they are like, interviewing and if they are, I presume it's being done remotely, if there are any external candidates? Or can you shed some light on what the usual process is when a club's interviewing? Or is this just an extraordinary situation with COVID that, you know, there is no normal protocol? Yeah, I think normally when clubs are looking for managers, they end up, you know, going into a, a random hotel somewhere off the M40 and, and mm. hoping that no one meets the sees them meeting each other <laughs> and having a chat. Um, but obviously these these aren't normal circumstances. Um, you just have to hope that Maxim and his internet connection is quite decent, that he can get a, a reasonable <laughs> Zoom call on the go with uh, the candidates that he wants to speak to. Um, from my understanding, is obviously sort of three key people making this decision. Maxim, Neil Blake... And, and Richard Hughes. And I'm pretty sure that they would have had, uh, I'm sure most football clubs really, even if you were Manchester United with Sir Alex Ferguson at the, at the helm, you would you would always have in the back of your mind 
who are the up and coming coaches, who are the managers that are doing well, who's doing well across Europe. Um, it would just be common sense to be thinking always about potentially, um, you know, who could jump into the hot seat. You're the same way that the manager should be looking at, you know, 11 different players that could come into the football club. Should there be an injury uh, or should someone come in and spend £1 million on a player and, and suddenly you've got to replace him? So I would be surprised if the football club didn't have a small list of players, uh, to managers that, were, that they were looking at and thinking, right, he could be someone that could replace you now. And, um, you know, and then as soon as the decision gets made, they, they start to action that and think, right, you know, we need to speak to this person, this person, this person, uh, and, and see what they've got to say. And, and then you'll sort of start, start to formulate an opinion as to who you believe is the right man for the job. And how do you guys feel about the club's future without Eddie at the helm? Is it exciting, the next part of the story? Are you slightly nervous? I mean, how do you feel about it? Well, from, from a reporter's perspective, uh, you know, it, I, it's an absolutely fascinating period. You know, really intriguing after so long um, with one manager. And, you know, as we were talking about before, a manager who has so much influence across the club, finding out how the team will respond, whether they can bounce back immediately, how they will take to a new manager, if they go internally or externally, you know, that, that makes it a really intriguing period. And, yeah, it is exciting. And I think from a supporter's perspective, it's... That, that sense of being new, you know, that, that that must be exciting too. And, you know, I think we've talked before about, you know, how the Premier League can become quite mundane, quite, you know, that sense of stasis, you know, when you're not winning games and you can predict results quite easily. That That's that's out the window with the Championship. So that that unknown, that uncertainty, and that thrill um, certainly makes it a bit more exciting. Of course, there's, you know, it's the, there'll be that still sense of, it's that shadow, isn't it? I guess when you look at the likes of, now, you make the comparison to, to Arsene Wenger at Arsenal or Sir Alex Ferguson at Manchester United. And of course, of course, they're a different level. But in terms of influence, you know, Eddie Howe is, is comparable at Bournemouth. So seeing how it plays out at Bournemouth, you know, how will they respond afterwards? Um, it'd be very, very interesting to see whether they, they can sort of step out of that shadow and, and, and keep progressing forward. Hmm. So uh, it looks like uh, we have lost uh, Mark there. Fingers crossed. We'll get him back before uh, the end of the show. So, yeah, um, quite interesting future for AFC Bournemouth. And it's a, it's very interesting in general, Peter, isn't it, with regards to what's going to happen next season? Because no one knows in terms of when fans are going to be let back in, etc. And, you know, Bournemouth have put out this whole season ticket thing that lots of people were very confused by. They're going to be crediting people's accounts back and then there's going to be a ballot for season ticket holders and you know, ticket holders. Uh, do you have any like, intel on what's going to happen or is it pretty much all revolving around what the government say? I'd love to give you some more in, in, <laughs> advice and also tell you that we're all going back, but it's very, very I difficult at the moment. Mm -hmm. And I do sympathise a bit with, with, with the club and especially from a ticketing perspective, it's, it's not easy at the moment, especially if you're trying to plan um plan for the year ahead so uh in terms of what next season will look like i think there were plans um and the premier league have been discussing you know ways in which they can get supporters back in even if it's just a smaller percentage of supporters but um again it's all contingent on government advice it's all contingent on whether it's safe to do so um and at the moment you know they, they've put a pause on all a relaxing of lockdown restrictions and which doesn't bode too well i think they've cancelled some test events so yeah, it, it's still a big unknown, really. Um, I'd love to be able to say, yeah, this is going to happen in this time frame. But I, I, I think if anyone does, they're not not being that really um, not not truthful. But you know, it's very hard to predict. It's very hard to predict at the moment. And uh, you know, hopefully, hopefully things will progress and they can, you know, once they can they can start getting supporters back into grounds, even small numbers. It, it will make a difference for sure. And um, especially from from a club perspective as well, as they they try to plan and. On the ticketing side. So we've got Mark uh, back in, so uh, we'll bring him back in there. And uh, oh, you know, sorry, you're not going to win a podcast of the year award, are you? After that, <laughs> I don't... disappeared. I think my battery went. Oh, don't don't you worry at all. We were just talking actually about you know what about it's been me? like. Uh, no, we weren't. We were talking about <laughs> having the fans in the stadiums and when that'll be. But um, from Sky Sports, you know, perspective, how how strange or you know different has it been to cover football? over the last sort of, you know, two months or so, Mark, it must be, uh, you know, very strange. It's, it's horrible. Um, I've been lucky enough to do a small handful of games for the Soccer Special um, whilst we've been 
you know, trying to get football back on and, and you know, get the season finished after the lockdown. And it's, it's soulless. Um, it's bizarre. It's, um, it just doesn't feel right. And whilst I know, sadly, the fans being within grounds, particularly at the highest level in the Premier League, doesn't make a massive difference to clubs financially. It absolutely makes a massive difference to the spectacle and the occasion and the environment and the atmosphere. And I think everyone is. It was everyone knew it beforehand that football without fans was soulless and it wasn't the same. But I think it's been proven just how crucial they are. And perhaps for those clubs at the top end of the Premier League that knew um, they didn't always need the fans within the ground because they make so much money from commercial entities and, and of course, TV rights. Um, I think what they've been uh, what they've been opened up to is that that whilst maybe they don't need them financially, they absolutely do need them. And, and football fans are at the heart of every football club and, and every match day experience. And Peter, in terms of covering AFC Bournemouth for The Athletic, um, our relegation, does that affect you? And, and how's, it, how's it going to be your relationship with the club over the next season? I mean, do you, do you still get to cover AFC Bournemouth in the Championship? He's followed Eddie out the door. <laughs> <laughs> He's gone. He's gone. Yeah, what's happening? Eddie took my thunder. Um, no, it's um, yeah, it's been quite uncertain for a little bit. I think um, I know I've, I've been asked quite a lot about what what happens to me after if they go down, and obviously after I got relegated. Um, but now I have a, a clearer idea now about what happens to me. I'll still be covering Bournemouth to an extent. I just won't be writing as much as I have done before. Um, they're going to move me to Fulham. So obviously after Tuesday night's playoff win, so I'll be covering uh, covering Fulham in there. Uh, First, first season back uh, in the Premier League after they uh, bounced back at the first time of asking. So, yeah, it's. Um, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm I'm pleased to to cover such a you know exciting club, and and you know I've loved covering Bournemouth. Um, I've only been here a year, and it's uh, it doesn't take very long um, to really understand how unique the club is, the community feel, and everyone's been so so welcoming to me and. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's it's a shame that I haven't been able to, to stay full time for longer. I think, um, but I'm I'm glad I'm I'm able to to continue to co- offering some coverage. The Athletic will still be covering Bournemouth um, as well, which 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 is a positive. And it's going to be such an exciting season too. You know, it's one of the, as I was saying before, it's so intriguing about what comes next, and you want to be following that really really closely. So. Um, yeah, new challenge for me it means I'm I'm upping sticks, leaving Dorset, heading up to heading back to London. So uh, we'll see how that pans out. But you know, as I say, I'm I'm lucky. It's you know it's a difficult time, especially in the media industry at the moment. So I'm I'm you know I'm I'm very happy still to to have the opportunities that I've got. So but yeah, looking forward to the new season. All the same. If if you're going to be covering Fulham, does that make you the Philip Billing of journalists? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, potentially, potentially, yeah. Um, sort of going the opposite direction. No, the same direction as Harry Arter, really. So, um, but Harry Arter's coming back. I was a Fulham fan. I'd think, hang on a second, he's just been covering Bournemouth <laughs> and they got relegated. What's going to happen to Fulham this season? <laughs> yeah, don't tell him that. I'll get, I'll get a reputation if that happens. So. <laughs> well, Relegation correspondent. It's- as far as AFC Bournemouth, it, it's felt like um, a season where, Jeff, we shouldn't be celebrating and whether there's going to be an end of season awards, we don't know, but, you know, it doesn't feel like there should be. I think some standout players include, you know, sort of Aaron Ramsdale, um, you know, Lerma's done all right, of course, Nathan Ake. Now, one of the end of season awards, well, I think you've done a few, Mark, maybe, but um, alongside Chris Temple a couple of seasons ago, I remember a certain Josh King made a, made a remark about one of your shirts yeah. and we had Nathan Nichols, a Cherries fan, who submitted a question for you saying, just where do you buy them? <laughs> uh, yeah, you've probably seen them on the transfer show as well. Um, yes. I like to, to wear a few few shirts on the transfer show. Um, I get them from a, a really nice place in Brighton, actually, in the lanes. Yeah, uh, and oh, it's cool. um, uh, a suit tailor um, and, um, you know, upmarket, as I like to say. Yeah. Um, place to get fr- nice clobber. Uh, it's called Gresham <laughs> Blake. And... Um, yeah. Uh, lots of colours, patterns, and uh, it's all a bit of fun, which I think reflects um, my personality just a tiny bit because normally I'm a bit grumpy. Um, but yeah, I think um, yeah, so it's a great place to go, and um, it's all a bit quirky and a bit different, and that's that's what I like. 
But what I notice is when you uh, post photos, that you know there are some people that you know might not you know know you and you know sort of might not know your personality, and they look at it for the first time. They see you in a Sky Sports studio, and they make you know, comments like, "What on earth is he wearing?" Do you kind of <laughs> see those comments? Do you laugh them off, or you know are they bait for you? Um, let, let's be honest, right? If you go on national television wearing, you know, crabs or um, fish. <laughs> or um limes or or, or, or bright <laughs> colors you know lime and purple or pink and blue um i'm kind of doing it for a reason um yeah. i'm not doing it because i want people to go oh my god he looks amazing i'm yeah. doing it because i want people to go oh my god look uh, yeah. and that's part of the the fun of the the transfer show and the fun of hosting these events um is that you want to stand out a little bit and you want to show someone that you're you're up for a laugh and absolutely, if, if I can be the butt of a joke because of what I'm wearing, then, then what I'm wearing is doing the job that I want it to do. Brilliant. Well, Jeff, I'm, I'm sure you'll agree with me that Sky and all the broadcasters and also Peter, you know, for The Athletic, challenging times, but they've been doing a sterling job, haven't they? Yeah, fantastic. I mean, I think Sky Sports is uh, unbeatable. You, yeah. when, when you see what... BT Sport and BBC have done with some of these games. You just know they're not a patch on what Sky have been doing. So I think TV, and I'm not just blowing smoke there, Mark. I think you I absolutely believe that. And Peter, I can't take credit, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> but but the Athletic as well. You know that I think for so many years we've been starved of really good journalism around the club, and it's it's been great to have you with this season. I'm sure it will continue next season. So really appreciate it. The thing about journalism, just to, to add to that, that we, me and Peter and, and, and any broadcasters or people in radio or, or writers, we can only be as good as the access we get. If we yeah. don't get access, if you don't go to these football clubs and say, oh, can we do this? We've had a little idea. We want to try this. We want to get access to here and we want, we want to try something like this. If they say no, which unfortunately there are so many clubs that actually just say no, it's a flat no, no, we can't, um, then we can't look good. So I think that's that's really a credit to Bournemouth and the fact that whilst they've been in the Premier League for five years, they could have so easily changed their kind of mentality and their ethos when it comes to dealing with the media. They haven't. They've they, they've still remained reasonably accessible, um, uh, and that's a credit to the media department, really. And, and I guess really, you know, Jeff Mostyn, Neil Blake, and Eddie Howe that they're they're open to let us do things because so many clubs don't. Yeah, just, and, just, just to reiterate on that, because yeah. obviously it's my first year covering and they didn't really know what to expect. And, you know, that's that openness isn't very common always in football. It's very easy for them to shut the door and keep things in-house. And increasingly so these days, you know, you see all these uh, in-house club interviews and, and, you know, that can be restrictive. But um, when you come into a club as someone who's completely new to it and you're still open to to ideas and, and to, to, to someone who's going to be badging you a lot more than probably they've, they've been used to for a while. So, um, you know, it's 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 really appreciated and it's not possible without it. So do you, do you get the impression just briefly, um, do you get the impression, Peter, that you know, given the circumstances of the lack of legacy with the club and being in the championship, do you feel as though they'll, they'll almost be more news nuggets to feast on next season in terms of athletic? Cause you did, uh, you know, a few articles uh, last season that were, you know, well, I said at the time, they may have been regarded by the club as not needed. Um, do you think that there's a bit more, maybe, you know, sort of ammunition next season available, you know, given the sort of circumstances around where we're at? Ammunition sounds like I'm going out to shoot them down, um, <laughs> yeah. which is not the case. I not. Um, no, it, it, it just depends, really. I, I wouldn't say there's more likely that things can happen, Um because it is a different, it's a changing situation. You want to to see how they adapt, and that that'll be interesting. And that especially with a new manager coming in, players wanting to leave, and that dynamic will be interesting to see. So you can see how that could happen. But um, it you know it, it it just depends on on how on how a club moves forward. Anything can happen in any given season. You see clubs sometimes that look at the pillar of stability. Look at Stoke City, for example, when the time they had in the Premier League, and all of a sudden that just dissipated and. And you know that that can happen to to, to most clubs. So, um, no, I, I I think you know it, it, you have to write the good and you have to write the bad. That's just that's part of the job. Um, and um, you know we'll continue to do that. That's 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 part of the role. And you know and and I think just going back to what we were saying before, 
you know, there have been pieces that haven't, you know, they probably club would probably say we're not needed, but, um, you know, they've still responded to that really, really well. Um, yeah. And that's very much appreciated too, which is, you know, such a, you know, a welcome thing um, for yeah. journalists because, you know, that's not always the case with other clubs. You can't well, always write positive stories week in, week out. You know, no. sometimes, you know, when teams are relegated, when, when they do things badly off the field, it's kind of part of the job. And the clubs that don't understand or appreciate that are the ones that, that would worry me, you know. If, if you've got mm. you've got a press officer or a club that, that's constantly upset with you for writing one negative story, um, then th they don't get it because it's it, you know sadly football isn't all you know um, you know positivity and happiness. You know there are stories and, and the fans want answers sometimes, and and we're always just a mouthpiece and a vehicle to get yeah. the answers that the fans want. Mm. Brilliant, yep. brilliant. Well, gentlemen, it's been great to chat today and uh, I'm sure your phones will be ready uh, over the next few days and weeks as I'm sure there's going to be plenty of movement at the club. Uh, Mark McAdam, thank you very much for coming on. No, quite all right, Sam. I've got, I've got to say, though, I do recognise you. Did you play at Dean Court a few years ago and score a worldly goal? <laughs> yes, I did. Funny, funny you should uh, mention that. Tell me the story was, uh, before we go. I'll, I, I'll, I disappeared I'll, I'll for five minutes, so I feel like I owe you five minutes of extra time. You know, this is this is Fergie time now. You got me. <laughs> right. I'll talk you through it. Um, so, oh, okay. working for AFC Bournemouth, you were working with John Sharkey, uh, one yeah. of my fellow school friends. We actually did a website together called Boscombe on the Web back in nineteen. 19... B O T W. B O T W. Yeah, that's it. We did that I for. It four or five years it became red and black after that and um you know knowing john working at the club he said uh, oh yeah there's a there's a match being played at dean court it was at about you know four o'clock in the afternoon it's um champs de saints which is mark's team but it's going to be like a bunch of ac bournemouth staff and we're short do you want to play I said yeah brilliant there was a court i i swear this happened <laughs> you took a corner it was uh, in the court you know by the corner between the north and east stand you pinged it over and i was on the penalty spot on the forehead, top left-hand corner. If you're Steve in a, Fletcher, you're in a Steve Fletcher, yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's where and... I recognise you from, you see. <laughs> you know, yeah. all the goals that have been scored, you know, Jermaine Defoe, Wade Elliott, Gareth O'Connor, Big Sam, Fletcher. And that, that one that you scored, Sam, is the one that sticks in my mind. <laughs> I thought so. I thought so. Um, but, yeah, um, thank you for bringing that up. I'm, uh, I'm glad we got it mentioned. But, uh, yeah. I could bring up loads more stories if you want. We're still in, we're still in Fergie time. Did I tell you about yeah. the time I played for the club? Do you know about that? Go on. Ah, no, so this is a good one. So um, yeah. years and years and years ago, uh, when Eddie was the reserve team manager, I said to him, you know, Ed, um, looking to do a little bit of a different feature, um, you know, what are the chances of me playing in a reserve game? Um, and he went, leave it with me. And then he came back to me about three months later and he said, Marky, we've got, um, we've got a reserve game. It's the final reserve game of the season. Next, uh, next week away at Exeter. Um, do you want to do your feature? And I said, um, yeah, 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 let me speak to the boss. So I spoke to my producer at Sky and I said, um, I've really, I've got this great feature to do. Um, I can play in a reserve game. And the boss said to me, um, uh, Mark, uh, I've got a plan for you next week. It's our last show of the season. I don't really fancy that. I've got something else for you to do. So I went, oh, okay, never mind. So I went back to Ed and I said, uh, Ed, I'm really sorry, um, we, we, we can't do the feature. He said, do you still want to play anyway? I said, yeah, definitely. So I went into Neil Vacher, signed the holiday Pontins <laughs> combination um, reserve team player official form and uh, travelled to Exeter away. Um, on the bench that day, Eddie Howe, Joe Roach, Mark McAdam. And um, we turned up to the training ground and the first thing I said was, hang on a second, why are we playing at the training ground? I thought we were we are playing at the first team stadium. He said, no, 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 it's the reserve game, Mark. We're playing, you know, on, the, on pitch 11 over there. It was absolutely teeming it. Like the, the worst rain you would ever see. And um, the pitch, and when I say, you can ask Eddie about this, when I say the pitch was under about three inches of water, it absolutely was under three <laughs> inches of water. So anyway, I, you know, I got out the bus and the lads are looking at me thinking, who's this joker? You know, we're here to win a reserve game. Even though it was, you know, three or four days before the season finished. So I, uh, I got on my kit, got changed, got ready, was warming up. You know, I was, I was, I was blowing out my backside by the time they'd even got ready for kickoff. But there I was, up and down the touchline, keeping warm throughout the game. We were one nil up, nice and early, and I'm thinking, perfect, you know, brilliant. And, and Ed said to me, you ready, Mark? And I went, yeah. So I did a few little shuttle sprints, got myself ready, came onto the pitch. Um, I remember the first thing I did was head the ball out of play. 
um, and uh, everything had to be played in the air because you couldn't you couldn't actually kick the, yeah. the you know the the ball on the on the deck because it was so wet and miserable, and um, yeah. So then uh, George Webb, who was playing at left back, chopped someone down in the area, and we went one all. And then two minutes later, we went two one behind. So uh, I never got the call to come back. Oh. That was it. <laughs> what a story! One See, like, uh, I come onto the pitch and we lose two one. <laughs> <laughs> Not how good. how times have changed wouldn't happen uh, in this era, would it? But what, well, I might get on the phone to Coops. You never know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you never know. You never know. Oh my goodness, Mark! Thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate it. No, anytime. My pleasure. And uh, Peter Rutzer as well. Thank you very much. No problem, Sam. Thanks for having me. And Jeff Hayward, um, I'm sure I'll be seeing you again for the podcast this weekend. So yeah, it's going to be an interesting release on me, Monday. Can you just talk me through that goal again, Sam? Were you? Tell you what, we'll do it off there, eh? Why not? Why not? Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for watching. Remember, you can keep abreast of all things AFC Bournemouth uh, through The Athletic, but also keep your eyes on Sky Sports News as well, as I'm sure you'll be seeing Mark appearing soon with some updates. Uh, remember to give this video a thumbs up if you can, and remember to subscribe, because I'm sure there's going to be a lot of AFC Bournemouth content coming in the next few days and uh, it could be big news. Up the cherries, we'll see you soon.